The second chapter of Colossians tells us the same story beginning with verse 12. Buried with him in baptism. Buried also your wisdom within through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotted up the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and to be able to be made to his cross. That is what God has done for us in Jesus Christ. Our sins were not imputed to us, they were taken out of the room. That is what we have in Christ. That is why we are seated in heavenly places in Christ. And all of that as a reality, Christ is ministering to us from the most holy place as we come in faith. All that he has accomplished for us is given to us through the Holy Spirit so that now we experience it though on earth. We can experience being seated in heaven with him though we are on this miserable planet that is rushing on to destruction. Hope you're following. Now, first, now the first verse of the third chapter, Colossians 3 1. If ye then be, 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 be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Then everyone that is risen is to seek the things that are above. Where above is above? How high above? As high above as the place where Christ sits. But how can I seek the things where Christ is unless I am near enough there to look around and seek those things and put my mind upon them? It is all in that. If he then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. For you are dead, and your life is in with Christ in God. Shall we take that precisely as the Lord gives it? Hear the question? Shall we take it precisely as the Lord gives it? Without any quarrying? I know it is wonderful. I know that for a good many, it seems too good to be true. But, it's, but there is nothing God does that is too good to be true. Because God does it. If it were said of anybody else, it would be too good to be true. Because they could not do it. But when God says anything, it is not too good to be true. It is good enough to be true. Because he does it. Praise the Lord. Therefore, brethren, let us rise. You just heard Brother Saul mention in his report that the prophet saw the people of God. When somebody asked the people of God, I should say, look, into low, look higher. They were higher. They made that cry light behind. And the new Jerusalem with Christ calling them in front. And anyone who took their eyes off the light of Christ, which is the true gospel, and what he's doing now in the heavenly sanctuary, fell off way below into the world. So this gospel in early and latter rain is to raise us right into heaven at the right hand of God. Now in our experience before literally at the second coming. This is what the reform is talking about. So let's look at it. Therefore, brethren, let us rise, and that will separate us from the world. That will put us in the place where long ago the prophet was told to look a little higher to see those who were in the right way. <coughs> But oh, shall we not drop everything and beg with him and take the death that we have in him and let that death that has been wrought in him work in us and then that life which has been wrought in him, that power which has been wrought in him will do for us what it did for him. That will take us out of Babylon. There will be none of Babylon's material about us at all. We will be so far from Babylon and all the Babylonian Germans that we will be seated at the right hand of God, clothed in heavenly apparel, and that is the only clothing that becomes the people now, for we are soon to enter into the wedding supper, and the fine linen with which the bride and guests are clothed is the righteousness of the saints, but he supplies it all, we have it all in him. Praise the Lord. Amen. All your father, your father, 
If you're not falling out, go for it home or follow it home. Because it's very important. We the defining power. There is with the divine power in that blessed truth. In Jesus Christ, the Father has set before the universe the thought of his mind concerning mankind. Oh, how much, how far a man misses every purpose, every idea of his existence, who is of his existence, who is content with anything less than that which God has prepared for him. Brethren, do you not see that we've been content to stay too low down? That we have been content to have our minds too far from what God has for us? That is a fact. But now as he comes and calls us into this, so you see where this message was called in our brain? Here is John's presenting a message that calls the believers into not only crucifixion, death, burial, and resurrection, but glorification, ascension, and seated, being seated in heaven. And that is the fullness of God's eternal purpose. It is the fullness of Christian character glorification. And I've been content to live too low. And the reformer is saying, you, brother David, have been content to live too low. Now set your mind and your eyes to the height that God has raised you in Christ. And kill it. And experience it. That's the call to me. We've been content to have our minds too far from what God has for us. That is a fact. But now as he comes and calls us into this, let us go where he will lead us. It is faith that does it. It is not presumption. It is the only right thing to do. Everyone that does not do it will be left so far behind that he will perish in a little while. You see the connection with the final crisis now? It's still Jones is moving. If we do not allow the true gospel to carry us through crucifixion, death, burial, resurrection, early reign, and then glorification, ascension, enthronement in heaven, latter reign, John says we'll be left so far behind in the little that is when he prays his prayers that we'll be left to perish. Here the heavenly shepherd is leading us. He's leading us into green pastures by the still waters. And by those still waters too that flow from the throne of God. The waters of life itself. Let us drink deeply. At this point we should raise up. Let us drink deeply. He that drinketh, Jesus says, shall never, never thirst again. So where is the good shepherd leading us? To drink of these waters. To drink deep. And live. The waters of this earth don't satisfy. Don't satisfy. But he that drinketh, Jesus says, shall never, never thirst again. This is the point the reformer ends on in that paragraph. paragraph. God's eternal purpose. Romans 8, 28 to 32. You know what that passage says? Let's look at it quickly. I know the day is humid, you've had a long day, but we're not far from the end, and you can go through it again. This is a very important message from, not from me, from the Word of God through the Reformer A.D. Jones. Let's look at Romans 8, 28, 32 for a minute. Romans 8, 28 to 32. Romans 8. 28 to 32. Romans 8, 28 to 32. Let's read it together. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren, Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? 
he that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us how many things? All things. Praise the Lord. The reformer continues now. We know that all things work together for good because God has worked it out before our eyes in Jesus Christ. Okay? Now we listen to John's word. Now we can look a little further. We can look at that yet further. I will say it again that the Lord, in order to show mankind what he has prepared for us, what his purpose concerning each man has set before us an example so that everyone in the world can see God's purpose concerning himself and can see it fully worked out. Now you hear people and psychologists and counselors and so on talking to young people and other people about role models and the purpose of life and all that kind of thing. You see the gospel is the answer to everything. You hear what Jones is saying? We are to tell every man that God's purpose for him has already been worked out in Jesus Christ. He can see it and accept it or see it and reject it. But that is the only purpose that will work for any man. So look at it again. I will say again that the Lord, in order to show mankind what he has prepared for us, what his purpose is concerning each man, has set before us an example so that everyone in the world can see God's purpose concerning himself and can see it fully worked out. God's purpose concerning us in this world is to keep us from sinning in spite of all the power of sin and Satan. His purpose concerning himself and us in this world is that God shall be manifested in sinful flesh. That is, in his power, he himself shall be manifested instead of ourselves. It is therefore that our wicked self shall be crucified, shall be dead and buried, and that we shall be raised from that deadness in sin and uncircumcision of the flesh to newness of life in Christ Jesus, in God, and seated at his right hand, glorified. That is the Lord's purpose concerning you and me. Praise the Lord. That's the Lord's purpose for every man. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. How do we know it? He not only says so, but he has worked it out before our eyes. He has given a living demonstration of it so that he carries us right through that now. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. We know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. What purpose? Why? His eternal purpose concerning all creatures, concerning man with the rest, which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. That purpose from eternity is purposed in Jesus Christ. And when we are in Jesus Christ, that purpose embraces us. Praise the Lord. When we yield to Christ, sinking ourselves in him, we become a part of that eternal purpose. And then just as certainly as God's purpose is to succeed, we shall be all right for we are part of his purpose. Then just as certainly as Satan can do nothing against God's purpose, so certainly he can do nothing against us for we are in that purpose. Praise the Lord. Oh, praise the Lord. You can do nothing against the truth but for the truth. And Satan cannot do anything against that purpose. The more Satan attacks God's eternal purpose, what happens? The more that purpose shines in its glory, exposing Satan and revealing God to be even greater than our wildest imaginations thought. Continuing then. Just as certainly then as all that Satan does, and all that the enemies of God's truth can do, working against God and his divine purpose. And at last, all these things against us, and all the things that will be against us in the final crisis, so certainly as all this cannot defeat or cripple that eternal purpose, so certainly it cannot defeat or cripple us, because in Christ, we are a fixture in that purpose. Oh, it is all in him. 
and God has seated us, has created us anew in him. Oh, praise the Lord. Jesus, our high priest, will prepare us. Now remember that is how the 1888 message fits in with the heavenly sanctuary. Christ in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary is the one that will prepare us. That is why we are to keep our minds focused on the sanctuary and we are told that the gospel will shine brighter from the most holy place. <clears throat> As we move on to the end now, follow carefully. Jesus, our high priest, will prepare us. Listen to Jones. He will prepare us. We cannot prepare ourselves. Listen to this next statement. Talking about the lukewarmness that developed in Adventism. We tried a long while to justify ourselves, to make ourselves just right, and thus get ready for the coming of the Lord. We have tried to do so well that we could approve ourselves and be satisfied and say, now I can meet the Lord. You understand how Jones is touching on how Laodicean lukewarmness develop? Are people seeking to prepare themselves? Not initially to lower standards, to prepare themselves. Listen to Jones. We have tried to do so well that we could approve ourselves and be satisfied and say, now I can meet the Lord. But we were never satisfied. No, it is not done that way. Whom he justified, them he glorified. Now, since God justifies, it is his own work. And when he is ready for us to meet the Lord, it will be all right, because it is he himself who prepares us to meet the Lord. Therefore, we trust in him, we yield to him, and take his justification. <clears throat> and depending only on that, we shall be ready to meet the Lord Jesus whenever God chooses to send him. Thus, he is preparing now to glorify us. Again, I say, it is a fact that we have been content to live too far below the wondrous privileges that God has prepared for us. Let the precious truth raise us to where he wants us. This illustration is a beautiful one that he closes with. No master workman looks at a piece of work he is doing as it is half finished <clears throat> and criticizes that and begins to find fault with that. There may be faults about it, but he's not finished yet. Praise the Lord. And while he works on it to take away all the faults, till he looks at it as it is in his finished purpose, in his own original plan, in his own mind. Now, when a man is building a house, right, you have Brother Boom and other people who are contractors and people in other areas. When manufacturers are making a machine, they have a picture of the finished product. And all the time they're working and going through the hard work and the bits and pieces, what they have in mind? The finished product. And Jones is using that illustration here. Listen to it. It would be an awful thing if the wondrous master workman, if the most wondrous master workman of all were to look at us as we are half finished and say, that is good for nothing. No, he doesn't do that. He looks at us as we are in his eternal purpose in Christ and goes on with his wondrous work. You and I may look at it and say, I don't see how the Lord is ever going to make a Christian out of me and make me fit for heaven or anything else. That may be so as we see it. And if he looked at it, at us, as we looked at ourselves, and if he were as poor a workman as we, that would be all there could be of it. We could never be of any worth. But he is not such a workman as we, and therefore he does not look at us as we see ourselves. No, he looks at us as we are in his finished purpose. Although we, are may, we may appear all rough, marred, and scarred now, as we are here and in ourselves, he sees us as we are yonder in Christ. 
And that is why Ellen White tells us in the book Steps to Christ, we are not to be discouraged by our own faults or the faults of others. We are not to focus on the faults of others or our own faults. We are to submit to Christ. Let the Holy Spirit bring us to confession, repentance, and all that is required. And keep our eyes fixed on Christ. And don't look at our faults or the faults of others because that will only discourage us. Keep our eyes on Christ. Because God is looking at us, not as we are in ourselves, but as we are in Christ and his finished purpose. Praise the Lord. So many people start coming to church, right? Uh, I, I didn't have anything. Somebody, and nobody didn't give me anything. Or nobody didn't come and look for me. What's the focus there? Don't mind all this we talk. The focus is a capital I that needs crucifying. And then... By looking at the faults of others, they lose their way. Many people have left Christ looking at the faults of others. And they'd be very surprised in the kingdom, and in, in the final uh, great right throne, that those they were finding fault of kept their eyes on Christ and were overcomers, and they, focusing on the faults of others, lost their way. Very important point Jones is making here. Okay. He continues as we approach the end. He is the workman. Praise the Lord. He is the workman. And as we have confidence in him, we will let him carry on the work. And he, as he carries it on, we will look at it as he sees it. Has he not given us an example of his workmanship? God has set before us in Christ his complete workmanship in sinful flesh. In Christ he has completed it and set it there at his right hand. And now he says to us, look at that. Look at who? Christ. Look at God's finished work for humanity in Christ. And the man Christ Jesus, who started out as a baby here on earth, is now glorified at the right hand of God on the throne. Praise the Lord. Look at that. That is what I am able to do with sinful flesh. Oh, praise the Lord. I love that piece. Look, he says to the whole universe and to us, look at Christ at my right hand. That is what I am able to do with sinful flesh. That when I'm finished with it, it is right next to me on the throne of the universe. Oh, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Now, he continues, now you put your confidence in me, God says speaking, and let me work and you watch and see what I'm going to do. You trust my workmanship, let me attend to the work and you trust me and I will carry on the work. It is the Lord doing it all. It is not our task at all. Now, if you have to have major surgery, now, t now let me put it this way, take the best surgeon in the world. If the best surgeon in the world has to have surgery, can he do it? Can he cut open his own belly and take out something? No. Though he's the best surgeon in the world, he now has to go to sleep and let the second best operate on him. Because when it comes to dealing with ourselves, even from nature, we cannot operate on ourselves. All we can do is what? Consent to surrender go to sleep under the anesthesia and trust the surgeon to do his work. And of course, they can make mistakes, but the master workman we are talking about here can never falter. And if we submit to human workmen to put us to sleep and cut us open at the physical level, Jones is saying, you can afford to surrender all to the master workman and just go to sleep and he will do the work when you wake up. It is glory. Praise the Lord. Which means that our battle really in the Christian warfare is the battle of remaining surrendered in full faith. It is when we step out of Christ in unbelief, not letting him do what he has to do that we run into trouble. When we remain surrendered to him, dead in him and resurrected in him, he carries on all the work all the way. Near the end. 
I like this illustration that he closes with. Now you can go outside of this tabernacle, <clears throat> Battle Creek, at that time, and look up at that window, referring to the window at the back of the pulpit, and it looks from the outside only a mass of melted glass thrown together, black and unsightly. That's from the outside. But come inside the building and look from within, and you will see it is a beautiful piece of workmanship, of sculpture, and written there in clear text, justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. The law of God written out in full, and the words, here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. That is the famous Battle Creek Church stained glass windows with that written on it. Now, he goes on to draw the illustration. Likewise, you and I can look at ourselves as we too often do from the outside and all looks awry, dark, and ungainly and appears as though it were only a tangled mass. But sometimes when we look at ourselves, sometimes when I pray, well, when I'm praying to look at myself, I cry and say, Lord, have mercy on me. Can you get me ready for translation? But we are never to give up. The reformer goes on. God looks at it from the inside as it is in Jesus. And when we are in Jesus and look through the light that God has given us, when we look from the inside as we are in Christ Jesus, we shall also see written in clear text by the Spirit of God. Justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We shall see the whole law of God written in the heart and shining in the life. And the words here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. All this we shall see in the light of God as that light is reflected and shines in Jesus Christ. Closing gem. From these are pages one, two, three. The priest of this world come up, said Jesus, and have nothing in me. John 14, 30. There was nothing in him that responded to Satan's sophistry. He did not consent to sin. Not even by a fault did he yield to temptation. So it may be with us. Praise the Lord. Christ's humanity was united with divinity. He was fitted for the conflict by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And he came to make us partakers of the divine nature. So long as we are united to him by faith, sin has no more dominion over us. God reaches for the hand of faith in us to direct it to live our soul upon the divinity of Christ so that we may attain to perfection of character. Praise the Lord. Take the time of over this message from the Reformer and all the uh, pieces from the Spirit of Prophecy this morning and this evening.